Come on, let's Woo! give God a praise offering. Yeah, Has he proven himself? Has God proven himself as a healer in your life? Is there someone in the house today who knows that if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't be here this morning? And it is simply because of the grace of Almighty God. God is so good, so happy to see every one of you today. And in the midst of all that's happening around the world today, we have this confidence that God is still in control, God is still on the throne, and indeed, He who has begun a good work in us, He is faithful and He will complete it. Would you turn your Bibles with me to Joshua chapter, chapter 5? As we look to the word of the Lord, grateful to God's mercy, want to greet every one of you today, those on each church platform as well as those in the building. And of course, we want to honor Assemblyman Nick Perry and his lovely wife and staff and grateful for the opportunity that in a few minutes right after the service, right after the announcements, then we'll make a quick transition because the scripture is right. The Bible reminds us that we should pray for those in authority. That as believers, we have a responsibility to lift up those who are serving in the public space. And um, we believe that God orders the steps of a people. The, right, the Bible says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And of course, one of my favorites, First um, Timothy um, chapter 2, it says, I urge thee, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in our godliness and holiness. And so we believe that as believers, we have a responsibility to pray, to encourage, and of course we're proud of the work that God has done through our assemblymen, and we are grateful for this opportunity. The word of the Lord in Joshua chapter 5, Joshua chapter 5. And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, when they heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan, from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males. Even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers, that he would give us a land that flowed with milk and honey. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, then Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. It came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. 
And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the marrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self-same day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year, the word of the Lord. Would you bow your heads in prayer as we go before the throne of grace, Father? We're humbled by your grace and grateful for the privilege of coming together in this fashion. We recognize that the world is in a global pandemic. A year ago, we, we thought COVID was a foreign problem. We thought COVID-19 was a virus restricted over in Asia. We saw it move over to Italy and eventually came right even into our own backyards. Over the past months, we have witnessed the loss of thousands of lives. And to some degree, every one of us have been touched by the loss or the grief or even the anxiety of COVID-19. Yet we believe that you're the God who establishes the boundaries of this virus. We believe that you're still the God who is in control. We believe that you are still working your perfect work, and we are so thankful, even with the advent of uh, vaccinations. God, I pray that you'll give us grace and give those in authority the wisdom in getting those vaccinations out to as wide a population as possible. And I ask, oh God, that in your mercy, that you'll strengthen the hearts of your people and give us grace to re realize that you are still at work, for you are sovereign, and you are still in charge. And so we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before I share the word of the Lord, I hope and pray that um, many of you had the opportunity of watching the PBS documentary, The Black Church. Now, if you didn't get a chance, that is the kind of documentary you need to sit with your children and watch. Because many times we enjoy the benefits of the progress we have experienced and totally forget the sacrifice that so many others have, have played. And one of the interesting things as we sat and watched the, um, the, the documentary and, and remember that um, it was the grace of God who kept slaves even on the plantation. Oh, I wish I had a witness today. It was that faith in Almighty God that even though living under unfair conditions and living under conditions that could have caused many to have despaired of life, there was a sense that there was a God in control, a God who loved all of his creation. And one of the interesting things, one of the parts that really struck me was as they talked about, you see, even as those slaves were on the, the plantations and they would find the time to worship. They would find the time to worship. I mean, literally, um, there was a sense that God was still in control. And, and, and um, it's amazing. They didn't have the beautiful churches that we have today. And they didn't have the, the, the luxury that all of us take for granted. But they would build a little house called the praise house. Now, I, I'm telling you, when, when I saw that and realized that these slaves had the capacity even in the midst of slavery, to praise God. Oh, I'm here to say to somebody, every now and then, you just got to put stuff down and raise your hands and thank God for how far we have come. Now, I believe we still have a much long way to go, but let's not forget how far we have come. And I believe in many ways this also ties in with the word I believe God is sharing or laid upon my heart to share with you today because it's a very simple phrase, the preparation pause. The preparation pause. Have you ever found yourself in an awkward situation because you weren't prepared? Perhaps you wanted to paint a room in your house 
You purchased the paint, the brushes, you did everything. And then when you pulled out the old rollers, you discover that after the last paint job, you had forgotten them somewhere. Here's what happens, folks. For years, the motto of the Boy Scouts has been, be prepared. It's a good motto to follow because preparation is essential to success in life. Success does not happen by accident. The idea is, as my father always said to us as children, he says it is better to be prepared for an opportunity which never comes than to have an opportunity for which you are not prepared. And I want you to understand, we are not here today because of accident. And when I see our young kids hanging out in the malls and talking to our youngsters about the value of an education, and I want to remind them, I say, look, you realize a few years ago that blacks were denied the opportunity of a good education. And the idea that now... I mean, come think of it. At one point, to segregate or to desegregate a public school, the federal government had to send marshals to escort those young children into a school with thousands of folks screaming in their faces. Now we have the opportunity for education. And I don't want anyone telling me education is not for everybody. You are not everybody. You have an opportunity. Educate yourself and prepare yourself. And so it is important that we recognize the value of preparation. An athlete who is preparing for the Super Bowl doesn't wait for a few months before the Super Bowl. The idea is, friends, every day, and amazing enough, when you win the competition, there are thousands around to celebrate you. But during the hard work of practice, nobody's there to celebrate you. A musician doesn't wait until it's time for the concert to practice. You've got to find value in the obscurity of your privacy and work on your craft and work on your craft because for you to produce in public, you have to practice in private. Oh, hear me today, folks. We have neglected the value of preparation. And in so many ways, we have learned to wing it. But style without substance is still failure. I don't care how stylish it looks, you got to have substance. And I believe that God has a plan even in the midst of COVID-19. I believe that in this global shutdown, when it seems as if the world is on pause, it's not just by chance or accident. I believe at some point, COVID-19 is going to come to an end. And for those who are going to thrive in the post-COVID years, are those who use the season of shutdown to prepare yourself for life after COVID. You see, my friends, opportunity, opportunity does not waste time with those who are unprepared. The idea is even God gives us opportunities to pause and prepare ourselves. In chapter 4 we see what God said to the children of Israel, you have not passed this way before. So he says, I want you to do something. He says, as you prepare yourself to cross over Jordan, he says, put your eyes upon the ark, which represents the presence of Almighty God. You know, the ark was that box that the priests would carry upon their shoulders. And in, the, in that little box, which was kept in the tabernacle, you find the, 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 the law. You find the statutes given to Moses, a bowl with manner as a testimony of God's provision and the rod of Aaron that, rod, that, that budded. And the idea is, he says, keep your eyes upon the ark. 
In other words, even in 2020, you've got to keep your eyes upon Almighty God. In the midst of all the world is going through today, God is still at work. Now, it's always amazing, always interesting for me, because here's what Joshua says to the people. And as they walk with the ark, keep your eyes upon the ark. In a crisis, it is easy to take your eyes off God. When the world is upside down, it is easy to take your eyes off God. As I watch the PBS uh, pro production on the black church, I believe that what has kept us over those adverse years of suffering through reconstruction, through Jim Crow season, through the civil rights, I believe that what has kept us is that we have learned to put our eyes on Almighty God. Not who is in the White House, but who is on the throne which reigns forever and ever and so the scripture says he says keep your eyes upon the ark but he goes further he says keep a distance now I know we come into a season when we have almost become so familiar with God that we have lost the reverence of God now I, I enjoy being a part of ecumenical groups because I believe that being a Christian doesn't mean you function in isolation. So I may, I may not follow your God, but I still should respect your faith. And being a Christian doesn't mean we get to this place where we become so obnoxious in our attitude. So from time to time, I would gather with uh, ecumenical circles, and um, whether they be um, Jews or Muslims or Hindus, the idea is there is a room that we can come together as people who practice our faith. And I remember one day we had, we had a meeting, and we would have the meeting in various, whether it's in a Christian church or uh, a synagogue or a Hindu te temple. And it's amazing that it, we went to one of these um, temples, and, and um, they said, no, there's one, one requirement, and you, you have to leave your shoes outside. <clears throat> We had to take off our shoes and leave it outside and walk in our socks. And we spent about an hour and a half. And as I'm sitting there and, and as they're teaching us about their faith and as we're learning more about each other, I thought to myself, can you imagine even in these present times that people still practice that level of reverence that says my shoes with all the folks gathered in this space, I'm still leaving it outside. Why? Because it represents reverence. And I want you to know as believers, oftentimes we become so familiar with God. We act as if God is a body. We act as if there's no need for reference or reference. But Joshua said, let there be a space between you and the ark because there is reference for the presence of Almighty God. And of course, as I reminded you during that season, it was when the, the Jordan banks had flooded. And he says now, in the, in, the, in the case of Moses, God said to Moses, stretch your rod. But in the case of Jordan, he says, you got to get your feet wet. And some of us are waiting for God to do the miraculous without getting our feet wet. We want God to do everything. And so here's what happened, folks. In, jo in Moses' generation, all God had to say to Moses, stretch forth your rod. But I've come to say to the Joshua generation, I've come to say to the generation that has a testimony of what God did for our forefathers. If God could have done it for our forefathers, my God, we have a reference they didn't have. And so he says, in your generation, you're going to have to step. Here's what happened, folks. There, I believe that even in our community, the reason we still continue to experience some of the pain and the plight of what's going on in our community is that people of faith refuse to step into the problem. You got to learn to step into that space. And here's what God says to Joshua, wherever you put your feet, wherever you step, 
I have already given it unto you. That's why you and I don't have the luxury of practicing our faith only in the church house. We don't have the luxury of a Sunday only worship. We don't have the luxury of only having an encounter. Hear what's happening. We got to step into the public spaces and say, I'm claiming this for Almighty God. We got to step into the school system and say, We are claiming it for our children's welfare. We got to step into the health. We talk about the vaccine, we talk about COVID. We don't have to go and research. In our present reality today, we know that even in our communities, there is still a health disparity. Uh, for us to get to adequate health, we have to go and serve. It's, it's, it's sad, but we're not talking about history here, folks. We're talking about our present reality. As we have been doing research on Brownsville, as we prepare to make the transition over in, to Ebenezer and learning more about the plight. And even I was so surprised in, in hearing that for the percentage of the population that has been vaccinated for or against COVID-19, in most communities, it's over 50 plus. In Brownsville, East New York, 5%. Now, what does that mean? It means before COVID, we were already vulnerable. And now during COVID, we're even much more vulnerable. No, no, no. Uh, now, let's, let's not ignore the fact that there was a time in our history where our own government used us as guinea pigs. Let, let's not pretend. We don't want to talk about the Tuskegee experiment. So there is a healthy skepticism. But we're not dealing with skepticism now after we have buried so many of our own people. We have gone from funerals to funerals to funerals. We have got to get, now here's what happened, folks. And I've heard all kinds of possibilities from the vaccine. But can I get a little personal? Because if I had two choices, if I had to face what we went through last year, where we saw people just dropping like flies, where we saw fun um, funeral homes being overcrowded, where we saw hospitals have to have temporary marks on their properties because they had so many unburied corpses. If I had to choose between repeating last year and taking the risk with a vaccine that probably came out faster than we anticipated. But I still believe that if we had to make the choice, if I was a gambling man, I would rather gamble with the vaccine than repeat what we went through last year. Now we've got to educate ourselves but we have, we have got to face the reality that we can no longer allow fear to drive us on the ground. We can no longer allow fear to cause us to expose ourselves, and which is why, as, as God laid this word upon my heart, because notice, as I reminded you last week, the idea is not only did God give them the instruction to follow the ark, because when they faced the Jordan, all they had to do was to step into the water, and the waters parted. But God did something that was quite strange. He says to Joshua, he says, when the priests stand in the middle of the Jordan, and the waters are piled on both sides, he said, I want you to do something. I want you to get 12 representatives, one of each tribe, to take a stone from out of the middle of Jordan and bring it on the other side and build a memorial. Now, over the years, when I've heard preachers preach on this passage, they talk about the memorial that was built on the bank. 
but there was another memorial. He says, I want you to take 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan and build a memorial on the bank. But he told him something quite strange. He says, I want you to take 12 stones from the bank and put it in the middle of the Jordan. Now, you and I would say, does that make sense? Because when the waters come back, that memorial in the river is going to be covered. But I've come to say to somebody today, you see the memorial on the bank is a testimony of the faithfulness of God. And you and I need to build memorials. Stop arguing about the Confederate statues and Columbus statue. They're going to build statues for themselves. We got to build some monuments that say to our children, this is our journey. See, every black family in this country holds it to yourself and your children to journey to D.C. and visit the Black Museum with your children and grandchildren. And I know you're going to do, you're going to spend time with the sports sections and the scientific sections and the entertainment section. But I, for God's sake, tell your children, you are more than just an athlete. Tell your children, we are more than just entertainers. Tell them that we are not the remnants of slaves, but of accomplished people who are great in their different accomplishments. And the idea, if we don't teach them the history, Nobody else will. So the idea is the monument on the bank was a public testimony to God's faithfulness. The monument in the river was a private testimony to the faithfulness of the people or the obedience of the people. So the idea is don't worry just about the public displays. Take time to build the private monuments that only God sees. You may not get applauded. You may never get celebrated. But God sees your private memorials because it's not for man. It is for God. And whatever you do for God, it is between you and Almighty God. And so very quickly, God says to, brings them up. After they've crossed over, they erect a memorial. And God does something that always amazes me. The Bible says, and God placed fear in the hearts of the kings round about. Sometimes we wonder why folks are intimidated by you before you come into your season. It's because they already sense favor over your life. And so you can't worry about folks who are intimidated by you. You got to find your purpose and prepare yourself to accomplish the purpose God has over your life. And so the first instruction he says to Joshua, after they have crossed over the Jordan, he says the first instruction is to press the pause button. To tell your neighbor, utilize the pause During COVID-19, there's a lot of stuff you and I can't do right now. Do you remember that um, the first few months last year after COVID crossed over and started ravaging in New York City, we had to shut the church door? You remember that for months, the public spaces were shut down? And, and, and here's what happens. Most folks were home and didn't have any idea what to do with the time they had. Because if you have time, but don't have a plan, it really doesn't matter. And so I want to say to somebody, even as God lays upon my heart, that you've got to start asking yourself the question, what am I preparing for post-COVID? So if you're preparing yourself to operate in a public space, you have to use this pause to study that space. 
You have to use this pause to get a mentor who's already doing well in that space to guide you because here's what happened, folks. Humility reminds us we need someone to guide us. And so notice what um, God says to Joshua. He says, Joshua, tell the people to press the pause. Now, when I read this passage, I, I, I struggled because I, I must confess, preaching also takes a little self-disclosure. Because when I'm on a roll, I get on the roll. And I just want to move on. So sometimes God has to have people in your lives to say pause. Because you can run out of energy and insight. And after a while, you're just running. You don't even know why you're running. The idea is most of us having crossed over Jordan in the season of celebration would take on Jericho. That's why no sports team, no sports team, no, no, no sports activity just continues for the whole year. It's called the season. So you don't have football and basketball at the same time. One run the season, and then after the season ends, it is time to pause and rebuild. It is time to pause and reflect. And here's what happened. God, that is interesting because that's one of the reasons why God even instituted the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a season to rest. It's a time to reflect. It's a time to regroup. And here's what happens. God says to Joshua, tell the people, I know you feel energized and you want to take on Jericho. Pause. And you got to do something. You have to renew your covenant with me. Now, I don't know what God has done through you. I don't know what God has used you to accomplish, but every now and then, you have to pause and say, God, all the glory goes to you for what you're doing in my life. The idea is never forget who is at work. And so here's what happens. is that the first thing he says to Joshua, Joshua, you need to create a pause, and we, we, I want you to circumcise every male in the camp. It's quite interesting, by the way, that after God gave instruction to Abraham about circumcision, that a, a, a mark, a public mark of the covenant between a Jewish male and his God was circumcision. We see how Moses, even before the children of Israel left Egypt, how they prepared themselves. And after they could have walked into their promise, you remember how out of fear and disobedience, they says, no, we're not going to go in and possess the land. And God says to them, you're going to walk, wander in the wilderness until every one of you except Joshua and Caleb die in the wilderness. So what does that mean? It means that during the whole season of wandering, nobody saw the value of circumcising the Jewish boys. It meant that this generation that had now walked in disobedience no longer followed the covenant. And here's what happens, folks. As I said to, we would sit with our children and we talk about our spiritual heritage and we would remind them that we are a Christian family. The idea is we have one God and there's no question about who that God is because here's what like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So you and I have a responsibility to train the next generation to put God first. Oh, we always challenge our children and, and even the young people of our church. We say your career should solve a problem. You can't, you can't pursue a career just because it looks good. You can't pursue a career just because it took an easy degree. 
That's why we need young people to pursue careers which solves a problem in our community. And so here's what happens when we talk about what's the issues going on. We challenge our children just as how my primary place is to function in the church house. God has a place for you to function as a, as, as a prophetic voice to Almighty God. It may be in the schoolroom, it may be in the legal field, it may be the mental health field, but wherever you're chosen, it must solve a problem in our community. Now, I, 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 I nothing against the rappers and nothing against the hip-hop guys, but I can tell you it doesn't matter how much money they make, we got to still ask ourselves, how are they solving the problems in our community? And if you're not solving the problem, you're no threat. If you're not solving, so even the, the sports teams, they are owned by folks who decides if they play or when their contract expires. It means that we have got to navigate a space that says, God, give me a passion to address an issue in our community so that my life can be spent in terms of real impact on our community. And so the first thing God says to Joshua, bring the people together and circumcise every Jewish boy. The idea is renew your covenant with Almighty God. The next thing that um, he instructed them, he says, do it now, not later. When God instructs you to do something, do it when he tells you to. You know, it's, it's amazing how many folks have regrets after, co after COVID. I mean, how many of us said, I wish we had done this before COVID. I wish we had gone down and visit. And so once COVID comes, we're like, can't come. So we oftentimes have regrets for things that we wish we had done. And so God says to Joshua, do it now that you have crossed over Jordan. And here's what happened, folks, is that the circumcision season was a time when the entire camp was vulnerable. You can't fight when you have just been circumcised. When you've been circumcised, you can't fight any battle. you got, you got to just sit there and heal. And here's what happens is, imagine being surrounded by enemies and God says, it's time to circumcise. The idea is it took faith. It took trust in Almighty God. But remember that circumcision is really the cutting away of the flesh. In a spiritual sense, the devil is going to tell you, you got to fight for yourself. And God says anything that is originated in the flesh can't please God. So you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to push back the flesh and do a work in you. So even to be circumcised at that season was a step of faith. It meant that God, we are trusting you. But here's what happened. That's why you have to recount what God did in the past. If he could have brought you through the Red Sea, if he could have brought you over Jordan, and he says now, is the time for you to renew your covenant. It may feel like you put your weapons down, but worship and obedience to God is a weapon because when you worship God, God moves on your behalf. And so it was, it was a matter, it was a sign of confidence. When was the last time? You could you say to yourself, self, I know this is a tough time, but God has the ability. What the devil wants is for you to lose confidence in God. But God says something to them. In that season when they're most vulnerable, God says, now I'm going to roll away the reproach of your past. He says, you will no longer be labeled as ex-slaves of Egypt. 
you are now going to be known as covenant people of Almighty God who is now in possession of your own land. Don't worry about the labels that folks may put on you. Don't worry about even if they use your past mistakes to label you. At some point, you have to bury the past. And you got to say, that's who I was, but that's not who I am today. And what you got to shake off the shame of your past and walk into that confidence of who God has created you to be. Oftentimes, we give people too much power over our self-esteem. Isn't it ironic that we can go into the most expensive stores, purchase products that we paid for legitimately, and before you make it out on the sidewalk, somebody pulls you in and begins to frisk you because they assume you stole the product. And you have to stay calm all during this time because you see what happens is even when you're wrongfully accused, you still have to know that God is still working somewhere in the midst of this. And here's what happened, folks. Even when you're wrongfully accused, you still have to know how to keep your calm. You got to know how to keep your cool. And you got to know how to strategize. Oh, make it. It's one thing. And there's a place for protests. There's a place where we come together on the streets and we say, no, enough is enough. There's a place for that. But I've come to realize that even the worst racist person still loves your green money. It doesn't matter how they don't like your skin color. The idea is we've got to recognize that there's a place for protest. But you still have to have a strategy. There's a place where we open our mouths. But there's a place where you open your wallet. And you've got to know that God has blessed you at a place where you can now determine where you spend and where you refuse to spend. So notice what he said. He says, Joshua, I want to renew my covenant with my people. He says, I want them to do it at a time when they are most vulnerable because that in itself is an act of faith. But he says, I want to roll away the shame of their past identity. And I want them to know they are now covenant people of God. You have got to look in the mirror and say you are wonderfully and beautifully made. You got to learn to love and appreciate you. You can't wait for anybody to endorse you before you endorse yourself. You can't wait for somebody else to celebrate you before you celebrate. You got to say, I am God's handiwork. I am wonderfully and beautifully made. I don't need to do all the stuff that Hollywood does before I accept myself. I am comfortable with who I am, and I am comfortable in my own skin. So you don't need anyone's approval before you can learn to acknowledge God's grace. But here's the next thing he did. He says, Joshua, there's something else that the folks have not done in a, all these years. He says, I want you to call the people together and celebrate the Passover. Here's what happens, folks. That is why it is so important to share our stories. That is why it is so important for us to tell our children the stories of how we came over. My God, every Jewish home, whether secular or sacred, whether they follow the religion or they just identify with the heritage, they have, when it comes on to Passover, it is a time when they celebrate what God has done. When was the last time you brought your family together and celebrated the Passover? Not just in the Jewish sense, but the Passover of what God did in your own house, in your own family. You see what happens is, Every Jewish family reminds themselves of the plagues that came upon Egypt because 
of the way that they had enslaved them. And remember, it came to that pivotal of plagues where the instruction was, the word went out, take a lamb, kill that lamb and take the blood and put the blood mark over your doorpost and over your windowsill. And here's what happened. When the death angel comes through, where he sees the blood, he will pass over. But I want to say to somebody today, in today's world, we don't have to take a lamb and we don't have to take a dove. For Jesus himself went to the old rugged cross. He gave himself a ransom for many. He gave his life on Calvary as the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. And today, as a child of God, you're under the blood covering of Jesus Christ. It means that when danger comes up he sees the blood when the devil wants to touch you he sees the blood you're under the blood covering and it is so important that we teach our children the spiritual heritage of what it means to be covered so notice what Joshua did he reminded the children of Israel of the covenant with God but they had to do it at a time that demonstrated confidence in God. Confidence is not what you say in times of leisure. Confidence is how you function in a crisis. You can say anything in times of vacation, but you know where your confidence lies when the crisis comes. But then he reminds them of the fact that God has now removed the condemnation of the past. And here's what happens. He says, now it is time to celebrate where God has brought us from. The Denver in, uh, International Airport, a few years came up with a proposal to revamp the entire baggage system as one of the largest airports in terms of land space. And while one of the largest in terms of land space, one of the busiest in this country. And so they came up with the idea of revamping the baggage system. And so as the airplanes would come in, the whole idea was to come up with a system that would rotate the baggages much faster. And so they came up with this brilliant plan and even had a consultant firm to do the consulting in terms of what a revised plan could be. But after they got the results, they ignored several key things in the proposal. The problem was they had already committed to a time frame that they had to roll out this new system. And so that meant they, they ended up cutting some corners which ultimately cost them over $2 billion. And after spending all of that money, they still had to give up on the project. Why? Because when you go into something unprepared with all the facts, it's going to cost you more than it would otherwise, and it may still end up being an aborted project. Here's what happens, folks. I'm asking myself and asking you the question. In this season of your life, what are you preparing for? Because I've come, like most of us, I don't have much patience. I want stuff moving pretty fast. But every time I've discovered that waiting is not wasted. Waiting time is not wasted time. They, some of the things, my, my, it, it's amazing. You appreciate your parents more as you grow older. You look like them, you start acting like them, and you begin to value them more, Tiffany. Uh, <laughs> but here's one of the things my dad would always say. He, he says, you, when you go to any appointment, bring a book. I, 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 I would always wonder. So anywhere, any appointment my father went to, he always had a book. So if he had to wait, he's in a book. So when he walks away from that 
appointment, regardless of how long he had to wait, he still had time to invest in himself. You see, here's what happened, folks. Because most of us are literally sitting, waiting out COVID-19. Waiting out that one of these days, things will go back to normal and you're going to pick up where you left off last year this time. But I've come to say to somebody, you can't turn the clock backwards. You got to grow through the crisis. You have to prepare yourself through the crisis. So when you come out on the other end of the crisis, you can discover that you have grown through the crisis. There are some folks who have never really taken control of their own lives. Their lives are always dependent on somebody else's decision. And so what ends up happening is they always have an escape route. It's not my fault. The leader, my boss, my supervisor, but I'm saying to every one of us in the hearing of my voice, I want you, I want to challenge you this morning. Take control of your spiritual growth. Don't leave your spiritual growth to anyone. That means you got to stay in the word and hear what God is saying to you at this season of your life. You can't wait for what the pastor says or what the evangelist says. You got to hear what God is saying in these seasons. But you also have to take control of your own economy. That means we can no longer wait out all the racist people in this world to die. Because their children and grandchildren, the idea is racism is a learned behavior. So while you and I are praying and hoping that all those folks are going to be raptured, they have already infiltrated the next generation. But I'm so thankful that God has brought us to a place where we can learn from the past and with God's grace, we can envision a different future. And that is why, that is why it was not a hard decision. When Assemblyman Nick Perry asked if we would facilitate the swearing in session because I am convinced that if we could go back to our history we will discover that the church was not just a place to pray that the church was not just a place where we could worship the church was also the place that spoke to the education of our children the church was the place where we strategized about our businesses. The church was the place where we knew there was a covering that we could come together. It was not by accident that if the early political leaders were all preachers. Why? Because there was a sense of empowerment that I am stepping into this space, not as an individual, but that I am stepping into this space as a representative, not only of man, but also of God. And what we need today are more politicians who fear God more than the ballot. We need more politicians who have a sense of godly fear that says, one day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give account of how I have ruled in the affairs of mankind and so this morning as we continue in this series of preparation or transition to Ebenezer before this year is over we believe in the Lord that with the developers working and all the resources moving in the same line that before this year is ended we will move from this building over to Ebenezer Plaza. Somebody should get excited about it. But the idea 
of moving from this building to Ebenezer Plaza is not about status and it's not about moving into a new space. It is literally about stepping into the Jordan and believing that as we step over in the Brownsville area that God would begin to shift the trajectory of that community so that in the years to come when you and I have passed on from this scene when the records are recorded it will be said that a community of faith moved into Ebenezer not just to move into a larger space but to make a larger impact for the kingdom of God and so I want to challenge our hearts and I want to challenge each of us as we pray every day as we call out for God's grace upon Brownsville and East New York not just to pray but that God will give grace that our presence could impact the economy our presence could impact the health that our presence could impact the stability of families. For God has called us at such a time as this to be his ambassadors for eternity. I want to invite us as we bow our hearts in prayer. Wherever you are, whether you're on the e-church platform or whether you're in the building, I want to ask you one simple question. What are you preparing for right now? What's the dream and the hopes and the aspirations that you have nurtured in your heart that before COVID-19 is over, you're believing God for a season? Here's what happens, folks. If you're just going to come up with a dream or your ambitions, I'll tell you where it will end. I hear the psalmist saying, unless you watch over the house, the watchmen watch in vain. He says, unless you build the house, the builders build in vain. It is literally in vain for you to rise up early and to build anything unless God is doing the building. This morning, I want to ask you again one more time, what are you in preparation for? Because you're not here just by accident. And so if you're here today, and somehow like the children of Israel, you have wandered from God. You have wandered in your own ambitions and have missed what it's like to be in covenant with God. I want to encourage you today to renew your relationship with God. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you today, make Jesus Christ your Lord. And if you're on the East Space, on the E-Church platform, and you will pray, you need us to join you in prayer for salvation, we want you to text C-O-G-E-F-S-A-L-V-A-T-I-O-N, which is C-O-G-E-F Salvation, to 59769. And if you're going through a season in your life where you need a church to come alongside and to pray with you, you can text C-O-G-E-F-P-R-A-Y-E-R, which is C-O-G-E-F Prayer, to 59769 and as we bow our hearts in prayer I want to invite us all into a season of prayer as we renew our relationship with Almighty God as we renew our confidence in his power to bring us into our destiny as we move into a space where we ask God to wash away the shame of the past and help us to walk as covenant people and to put our confidence and trust and then to celebrate 
what God has done for us. And as we go before the Lord, even in a brief moment of prayer, would you renew your relationship with God as a covenant child in his family? Father, we bow our hearts before you today, grateful for your mercies, grateful for who you are, grateful, Father, that we can gather in this place to worship you. This morning I ask, O oh Lord, that you'll forgive us of our sins. Where we have walked in disobedience, where we have walked in our own way, would you forgive us, Lord, and give us the grace to recognize we're here for a purpose, that our lives were not, are not here by accident, but that you have placed within each of us a creative space to pursue that which you have birth and I pray that whether it be in the era of politics in the era of church in the era of community in the era of education in the era of health give us grace Lord to pursue that destination to which you have called us to function so that our lives might be spent on purpose I pray that you help us not only to find the safe space in the sanctuary but that wherever we go give us grace that we may claim your work and your will in that space you said that when we pray we should pray our father what in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven and so we pray let your will be established on earth and use us as your ambassadors to do your perfect will in Jesus name we pray as we stand together for a few instructions as we na as we navigate uh, the transition I'm going to be praying the benediction which brings officially to close the service and then the announcement and right after the announcement we're going to be having two of the pastors to lead us in prayer as we pray for our political leaders we invite you to remain with us as we transition to this brief commu community swearing in ceremony for assemblyman nick perry assemblyman perry <clears throat> has been a friend of our church and a very active community advocate in Brooklyn and as a ministry we recognize our privilege and responsibility to pray for our elected officials our community leaders and those who serve in the greater good so following the moment of prayer with our pastors we will begin a short ceremony and we invite you to join with us in worship and prayer as we lift our assemblyman before the Lord in Jesus name so as we remain standing I will do the benediction then I invite you to be seated I know we're gonna have a few shifts in space to facilitate the swearing in so I want to encourage us remember you're still in the church house maintain the reverence of the presence of the Lord and I invite you to stay as we share in the swearing in ceremony of our own assemblyman Nick Perry may God bless you and keep you may he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may he lift the light of his countenance upon you and may he grant you his peace both now and forevermore and all of God's people say all of God's people say.